like in like bigger sweatpants than that one too. Unless they say they like put it on the calendar. So if somebody like a fifth client's come in or they hire us, they dress up. Next week is spirit week, and Monday week is spirit week. You guys are so green. Come for that. You guys, are you ready for the tribulation? We are going to get into it tonight. So 7 o'clock, I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump in. Lord, thank you for allowing us all to come together in this place. And uh, I know very well, if we were not doing this together, I would not learn near as much, Lord. So I just thank you for all that, that we are learning through your word. And as we get into a, a little bit of the scary stuff tonight, Lord, please just... Uh, Show us how it applies to our life. We, we thank you that we can have the security of knowing that we don't have to worry about this personally if we have repented and believed in Jesus. But, but Lord, there's still a purpose for us to learn this and to learn it well and to be able to relate it to others and to be praying for others. And so, Lord, please just speak to us, make it clear, and give us a clear application of what we are to do as we leave this place and how we are to glorify you with what we learn. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, uh, let's just do a quick review as we get started of, of what we covered last week. So last week, we looked at a detailed overview of the tribulation, starting in Daniel. And, and to me, that's really helpful to understand where all this comes from, where the seven weeks come from, where it's, how we know it's prophecy. We looked at key descriptions of the tribulation in Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 2. We compared Daniel with Revelation 6, 1 and 2, and we saw that the Antichrist appears on the scene to make a covenant with Israel when Jesus opens the first seal of the scroll. We talked about God's purpose in the tribulation, that it's focused on the Jews, but at the same time, all unbelievers, Jews and Gentiles, will go into the tribulation. And so... It is God's final opportunity for everyone, all unbelievers, to repent and believe in Jesus while his judgments are being poured out on an unbelieving world. Tonight, we're going to go through Revelation 6, which describes the judgments which will come as Jesus opens the first six of seven seals on the scroll which he received from God the Father. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different before we get into Revelation 6. This is I, I debated about this all week. I put it in in the beginning of the week, and then I took it out, and then I put it back in today and decided this is something that you need to hear. But I can't tell you what I'm about to go through with you relates to Revelation. Okay? It may relate to Revelation, and it may not. But it is future prophecy. And... Um, I'm of the belief that where are you going to hear about future end times prophecy? You're not going to hear about it in your churches. You know, it's just that stuff is not taught. The only time you're going to hear about end times prophecy is in a end times prophecy class. So um, I want to talk for just a few minutes about the Gog Magog War. Now, who has heard anything about the Gog Magog War? Do you know about it? Okay, a handful of you know a little bit about it. Okay, Ezekiel 38 and 39 tell us about a future war that will happen in the last days. This war has not happened yet, and I don't know if it will happen before the rapture and the tribulation, during the tribulation, or beyond that. My suspicion is, what I believe is, is that it's going to happen before all of this. Before the rapture, before the tribulation. Not sure if it will happen before the rapture, but I believe it will happen before the tribulation. But I can't tell you that for sure. What we do know is that it is end times prophecy. Now, it appears over the last two months that God has been setting the stage, setting the players for this war that is prophesized. Now, does that mean it's going to happen in the near future? No. But if it does happen in the near future, and I haven't told you about it, and then later we 
talk about it, and I say, oh, no, that was in times prophecy. You know, that, so that's why I want to talk about it for a few minutes tonight. Now, I do think it is relevant to our discussion for two reasons. It could happen right before the tribulation, and it may be one of the reasons Israel will be ready to accept an agreement with the Antichrist. May not. May be. Okay? It could happen early on in the tribulation. It could even be associated with the second seal that we're going to talk about tonight. I just, there's not enough in scripture to tell a specific time frame, but because it's end times prophecy, I feel like it's important for you to know. Okay? All right. So, this war is described, as I said, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, chapters 38 and 39, and it's called the God Magog War, also known as the Ezekiel War. And we're going to just read a little snippet from Ezekiel, Ezekiel, that's hard for me to say, Ezekiel 38. For you to understand the full context, you have to read all of 38 and 39. So I encourage you to do that on your own. But let's take a quick look at Ezekiel 38, verses 14 through 16, which kind of tells us a little bit about what's going on. It says, Therefore prophecy, son of man, and say to God, Thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel are living securely, will you not know it? You will come from your place out of the remote parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly and a mighty army. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am sanctified through you before their eyes, O oh God. It's just a little snippet. Let me give you a bigger summary of what this war is all about. So in the last days, Israel will be invaded by a coalition of nations led from the north. But God is going to miraculously intervene and save Israel. These invading nations... The top three are Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Now, when I talked to my husband about this, he said, well, where do you see Russia, Turkey, and Iran in Scripture? The answer is, you don't. You see the names of the original people groups. Um, for instance, Magog was the son of Japheth, who was the son of Noah. And he settled in Russia. And the same is true for these other names. I've listed the current names. But if you go back to Genesis, you see the names of those people groups and where they settled, and they settled in these places of Russia, Turkey, and Iran for the ones on the north. And then they'll be joined by Sudan and Libya from the south. And so the reason that they want to invade Israel is to take its plunder. Does Israel have plunder? Does Israel have anything that people would want? They got a whole lot of stuff that people would want. They have oil and gas like crazy. They have an abundance of green pastures and animals and food. They have amazing technology, medicine, agriculture. They have the top scientists in the world and they have the top research teams in the world. And people are taking notice, okay? Now, what's going on right now that we should think about this prophecy at all? Well, here's what's going on. September 16th, guess who came together in Syria? Russia, Turkey, and Iran. They all now have boots on the ground in Syria. Well, why do we care? So what? What does it matter that they're in Syria? And why would Russia, Turkey, and Iran care about Syria? Because it's on the northern edge of Israel. It's their neighbor. Let's take a look. Syria borders Israel on the very northeast edge. Turkey is from the north of Syria. Then you've got Russia further north from Turkey. And then you've got Iran east of Syria, east of Iraq. And then the other countries involved, Libya and Sudan, are further south. These countries are coming together. And guess what? They don't like Israel. Now, Russia's still acting like they're, they're friends with Israel. But, see, we know that Russia 
is starved for oil and gas. So there's a lot of plunder here that they would be interested in. Now, what's preventing these countries from attacking Israel today? Or attacking them individually? Well, Israel has an elite military known as the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. They have a state-of-the-art Iron Dome missile defense system. They have a prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is an IDF Special Forces veteran who will not hesitate to defend this country with all the firepower he needs, which would include nuclear weapons. Now, here's the issue, though. The globalists in Israel are determined to push Netanyahu out. That's what they're trying to do right now. See, Netanyahu is a nationalist. He cares about the country, not this global one world government. And so as a nationalist, and he's been in there for quite a while, guess what? The economy is doing tremendously better. Their unemployment is way down. And so he's succeeding as a nationalist. So they need to find a way to get him out so that they can usher in the one world government. If they get Netanyahu out, Israel is going to be like the prize cow with no leader, which is going to just make them even more so be ready to come in and invade. Now, one thing that is very interesting in this prophecy in Ezekiel 39.9, it says Israel will burn the weapons of war left behind by, from these countries that invade and use them for fuel for seven years. Hmm, interesting number. Now, could that be during the tribulation? Maybe so, although when I was talking to Jim about this, he pointed out halfway through in the middle of the tribulation when all hell breaks loose and the Antichrist isn't playing nice with the Israelites anymore, they're gonna be running. So that means it would have to be before the tribulation. It would seem. But let's look at a scenario. Let's just suppose. The reason I'm doing this is because I want you guys thinking of what's going on in current day and comparing it to prophecy. That's one of the things I'm hoping you get out of this class is that you learn what prophecy says and you compare it to current day so that you know what's going on and so that you're aware. But I'm going to just make something up here. This is not scripture, which is very, I never do something like this. This is just an example. So let's say the God may God war happened before the tribulation. How could that pave the way for the Antichrist covenant? Well, could it be that the God may God war kicks off, Israel is invaded, God defends Israel, kills most of the invading army, the, the rest of them run and, and retreat, but then the Middle East is even more on edge for fear of this war breaking out again. And so then the UN, who wants this one world government, sends the Antichrist in to offer this peace agreement with Israel. And then the weapons from God and God war are burned for seven years. Now, is that what's going to happen? No. That's why I made up. Okay? The point is, we need to know. Jim? The half-life of the Russian missiles is roughly seven years. Ah, okay. They use a nuclear weapon. So they'd have to be burned for seven years before. Oh, no, not yet. So if they get them burned, they can They're going to burn for, okay, gotcha. So my point of bringing this up to you is to pay attention to the development of nations that are aligning against Israel. Watch. This is important stuff. We need to know this because it's future prophecy. Pay attention to what globalists are doing to defeat nationalism because that's, when, when we see this socialist effort, this global effort, that's what kind of the precursor is to the one world government. It could be here, it can be in Israel. There's it's something that we need to pay attention to. We need to pay attention to talk about the third temple. We need to be aware that all of these things are laying the groundwork for the tribulation. So. Those are symptoms that we are getting closer. Now, am I saying when it's going to happen? No, we don't know, right? We do not know. But Jesus tells us in Scripture that you will know the season. And so we need to be watching the symptoms, and these are symptoms, okay? All right, enough about that. Now we're going.
going to Revelation 6. So, Revelation 6, there's seven seals. Only six of them are going to be in Revelation 6, the first six. The first four seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Everybody's heard of that, right? Which probably, I don't know if you knew that that was the, uh, the first four seals are associated with the first four seals. So the seals are the first of three series of judgments. So there's seven seals, and then there's going to be seven bowl judgments, and this, then there's going to be seven trumpet judgments. Tonight we're talking about the first six of seven seals. Now, if you are really analytical, and you go through Revelation 6 through 19, and you mark every time sequence in there, you can actually map out and see that Revelation 6 through 19 shows us that it's a seven-year period when you look at those time sequences. And when you look at those time sequences, you can also see that the seals cover the first quarter of the tribulation, which is the first 21 months, or so it appears. Can we know for sure? I don't think we can know for sure, but that's how it appears when you map out the time sequences. Let's look at the first seal in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. This is the white horse. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, saying as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So, where is Jesus in this passage? Opening the seals. Opening, where are you, Heather? I know it's your voice. There we go. <laughs> Jesus is, is the lamb breaking open the seal. A lot of people will say, well, he's on the white horse. No, nope. he's not the one. He's a devil. Yes, he's, in, he's breaking the seals. He's not the rider on the white horse. He will be the rider on the white horse in Revelation 19 at the end of the tribulation. Not now. Okay, so then we also see that the, one of the four living creatures is saying, come. Who's he talking to? John. John. Correct. Why do you say that? Because John is the one that's seeing this vision. And when Jesus breaks the seal, the holy preachers tell John to look down at earth to see what's happening in coordination with that breaking of the seal. That's exactly right. So John is up in heaven, and the, one of the living creatures says to him, Come. And actually, in the King James Version, it says, Come and see. And then it says, I looked. So we know he's talking to John. And then he's looking down on earth at this vision of what is happening. So, who's on the white horse? The Antichrist. The Antichrist, the Antichrist is on the white horse. And the reason that that makes sense is because the Antichrist will mimic Jesus and appear to be the Savior of the world. So since Jesus is going to come on a white horse at the end... The Antichrist is coming on the white horse in the beginning. At least, this is how he's described symbolically. Okay, so this makes sense. And then he has a crown. This is a Stephanos crown, which means victor. So he's going to be victorious in what he's coming to do, which is establishing this covenant. Now, he has a bow, but there's no mention of arrows. So he has the military power, but he's not using it to do this conquering. There will be a world leader that comes with the pretense of creating world peace. However, his real agenda is going to be leading people in rebellion against God. So he's going to conquer the world government, starting with the Jews, by peaceful diplomacy. Okay? He'll make a covenant with the Jews, allowing them to resume sacrifices and grain offerings. Now, in order for there to be sacrifice and grain offerings, what 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 else has to be there? The temple. We, we have to have a third temple. So by the time that happens, there will be a third temple. Now, I think he will be a globalist, convincing everyone that the only way to achieve world peace is all nations come together in a one world government. We know this. We're going to see this later on, but we know this. So it seems to me, though, logically... Common sense would prevent this from happening, right? I mean, Hitler came with the pretense of peace 
and then he murdered 11 million Jews. So why would people fall for this again? Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? History repeats itself. So, yeah, history repeats itself. So socialism has complete failure all over the world. Communism has complete failure. You would think we'd know better than to fall down. I mean, some things, yeah, we're going to repeat, but 11 million people were killed? you think we'd get that one and go, oh, no, we see the same symptoms. We're not going to do it. But see, what's interesting is our world today in the United Nations is seen as the only answer to world peace. And did you know that the United Nations has a goal? You can go look this up. They have a goal of establishing one world government by 2030. That's in 10 years. They want to establish one world government. So you can see where this is going. I didn't, I found this online. I didn't, and I heard this, looked it up, found it. It's pretty well known. It's not even being hidden. So this is supported by the globalist agenda all over the world. We see this in our own country. We see this, we see news networks. We see the World Bank. We see the socialist leaders all over the world all encouraging this one world government. So we're going to see a little later in Revelation that that's what's going to happen. The one world government will happen. Prophecy tells us it will. The Antichrist will sign the covenant with Israel. He'll end up controlling all nations with a one world government system. We just don't know when. But can't we see it's getting closer? It's like you could see all the pumps being primed, right, to, to, for this to happen. But we do see that the majority of the world is ready for it now. They're already willing to accept it. And even we even see that the two most successful democratic republics which is the United States and Israel right now, they're also starting to usher in this time. Even though both of those republics have low unemployment, very strong economies, the majority or a bunch are wanting to move to this other structure of government. So we know we're getting very close when we see that. It's something to pay attention to. Now, could the globalists who want this one world government be right? Could that be a way to achieve world peace? Would that happen? Is it possible? No. no? I agree. Why not? Because the Bible tells us. Yeah. Because the only way we can have peace is if Jesus is ruling. Exactly. World peace will never be accomplished by a man. World peace will only happen when Jesus returns, defeats evil, and ushers in his kingdom, the millennial kingdom, is when we'll have world peace, not in the church age, and certainly not in the tribulation, right? So the problem with this one world government, which we're going to see, is the same problem we see with all socialist, communist countries. And really, monopolies, we see the same thing. There's no system of checks and balances to prevent those who are in charge these dictators from lining their own pockets while the people suffer, right? There's no system of checks and balances. So lives are always destroyed and never improved. And that is what will happen as we get to this. That's what the Antichrist is going to come in and say, peace, peace, peace. But then the lives are going to be destroyed. So we can kind of see that we're going to that. Now, how close are we to the kickoff of this first seal? The Antichrist signing the agreement with Israel. Well, let's look at the symptoms. So the Jews now have everything they need for the third temple. Are you aware of that? The Jews have all the utensils. They have practicing making the showbread. They have the priestly clothes. They have the Levitical priests. They have the blueprints for the third temple. They're actually practicing the sacrifices so that they're getting ready. The one thing that's missing, the one thing that's been missing for the last 2,000 years since AD 70 is the ashes of a pure red heifer are needed to do the ritual cleaning of the temple. And they haven't had a pure red heifer for the last 2,000 years until, until September 10th. 2018. 
a red heifer was born in Israel that now meets the qualifications. So they now have everything they need for the third temple except permission to build it. And as a matter of fact, you can go a little step further and say there are no prophecies that need to be fulfilled before the rapture and before the tribulation. And there's no prophecies that need to be fulfilled before they build that third temple. There's nothing left. They have everything. Now, all that says to me is I need to be paying attention to what's going on with all the news about the temple because we've got to be getting close, right? All right, so let's look at the second. What happens after this peace agreement is signed? So the Antichrist comes in, and then let's look at verses 3 and 4. He broke the second, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. And that, and that men would stay, slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Who breaks the second seal? Jesus. What is the second horse introducing? War. war. If he's taking peace from the earth, he's introducing war. So that means peace it will exist, right, when the second horseman comes. And where could that peace come from? Well, it could come from the fact that the Antichrist has just signed this agreement. And so now there's peace. And so then the second horseman comes. And it says that there will be a great sword which was given to this horseman. That great sword is called a mashera, which would have been used, it was more like a dagger. It's not a, the kind of sword that went way down to their feet. It's more of a dagger for hand-to-hand -hand combat. So that's representing the type of war we're talking about here, I guess you could say. Now, red could symbolize bloodshed. So maybe that's why the horse is red. Because if this war is going to go on, there's a whole bunch of people that are going to die. Now, what could cause war after the, after the Antichrist initiates this agreement? What could be the catalyst for that? Breaking. Say again? Breaking it. Breaking it, okay. But this is beforehand. This is just in the seals. So he hasn't broke the agreement yet. Maybe it's the God make God war. Maybe since there's peace in Israel, it's, maybe that's when these countries come in. I don't know. They could come before him. It could be that the Antichrist starts extending his control, trying to take over these other countries, and they don't like it. And so then they're fighting against that. Or it could be that the way he takes over the other countries is by war. We know he has a peace agreement with Israel. We don't know how it's going to extend out beyond that. I don't know. But we know the second seal is that war is going to break out. Let's look at what the third seal. You guys going okay? Let's look at the third seal, verses 5 and 6. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. This is one that I kind of think, what? What, what does this mean? Right? But as you dig into it, okay, what kind of scales does the writer have in his hand? Well, it's called zugos, and this is a balanced scale for weighing food. So this symbolizes the need to carefully measure food, ration food. This is going to be a famine. The denarius was a day's wage. So you can only buy a quart of wheat for a day's wage. That's not going to get you very far. That shows how severe this famine is going to be. This is going to be worldwide famine. Black is typically used for famine. And famine often follows war. We know this. World War I. And then famine followed after it. So it's not surprising that there's famine after war. Currently, a third of the earth is starving. And it's going to be much larger scale than that. So that's kind of scary. And then we see, do not damage the oil and the wine. 
What does that mean? Any ideas? It actually means the oil and the wine symbolize wealth. So when it says don't damage the oil and the wine, that means the wealthy are still going to have what they need. It's going to be everybody else that is going to be undergoing famine. I don't know exactly what wealthy means, but that's, that's the idea here. So how could this all happen? Well, the church is raptured. Again, I'm just speculating, right? This is not scripture. Church is raptured. And then there's worldwide chaos. And so it's the perfect storm for the Antichrist to come in and sign the covenant with Israel. And so then it will go from chaos to calm. But as efforts increase to get all nations on board under this one world government, some will resist. And World War III breaks out. I don't know that that's the scenario. We're not going to know if that's the scenario. But what we do want to pay attention to are symptoms. That's why I'm suggesting that we think about it. We want to be paying attention to symptoms. Now, what would you expect to follow world war and famine? Death. Death. So let's examine the fourth seal, which is death. Verses 7 and 8. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. So why are Death and Hades depicted as riders on horses? It's symbolic. The action is kind of a pukey, greenish, yellowish, grayish color. It's what you would picture for death. Okay? So, now, Hades. Hades is following after death. Who's in Hades? Unbelievers. Unbelievers are in Hades. So, Hades is the temporary place of torment. All unbelievers go when they die. Hades is following after death. So this is talking about unbelievers. Because believers don't go to Hades. Okay? So, what happens once they go to Hades? Is there any way out? There's no way out. From Hades, that you're staying in Hades until the final judgment. And once the final judgment comes, once Jesus says the final judgment, your next destination is hell is eternal forever hell. There's no getting out of Hades. We know this because in Luke 16, 23, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it, we hear that life, you, you have the opportunity in this life, and after you die, if you haven't trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's no second chance. You're in Hades, in the place of torment, and the only way out is the great white throne judgment, which takes you on to hell. So I know that that probably brings up a ton of questions. And if you can, write them down, because we're going to go through that stuff in great detail when we get to Revelation 20 at the great white throne judgment. Okay? But for now, remember that Hades means this is talking about unbelievers. And so then authority is given to death and Hades over a quarter of the earth to do what? Kill. Kill with all kinds of different means. So currently, 8 billion people on the earth. December 2019, 8 billion people. All right? Now, we take out 1 billion and say they're raptured. That still leaves 7 billion. A quarter of 7 billion is 1.75 billion people. That's a lot. Yeah, 1.75. So currently, China has 1.3 billion. This is 1.75 billion killed in this seal. That's more than any war we've ever seen. And so we can understand why Jesus would say this time's going to be worse than any time we've ever seen. But this is just the fourth seal. It's each seal, each judgment is going to get tremendously worse. We're, we can be 
thankful we will not be here during this time. Fifth seal. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Okay, so the souls under the altar. That can be a little confusing. Here's the gist of it. In Leviticus 4, 7, the blood of sacrificed animals is poured at the base of the altar. But in John's vision, he sees the souls of the martyrs. They're the ones that are under the altar because their lives were being poured out like a sacrifice offering to God. So it's symbolic. But what we should notice is during the tribulation, there's going to be many who are going to be martyred for their faith. Now that doesn't contradict the pre-trib rapture view because... Everybody's going to be raptured, and then the tribulation starts, and there's no believers. But people are going to become believers during the tribulation. If they're believers and they're killed, they're immediately in heaven with God, and they get white robes. If they're not believers and they're killed in the tribulation, where do they go? Hades. Hades, right. So we see the difference. We see that there's two different people groups. There are those who... In this text, is called those who dwell on the earth. That's the unbelievers. They die. They go to Hades. And then we see those who were, would not um, refrain from the word of God and their testimony. If they die, they're immediately in heaven with God. Same is true today, right? This is not just during the tribulation. This is true today also. Unbeliever dies, they're in Hades. Believer dies, they're immediately in heaven with God. Okay? So, that's a key thing to notice there, that these martyrs in verse 11 are immediately with God. Now, I'm, I need to speed up here a little bit. Let's look at the last passage. The sixth seal. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast into unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong, every slave and free man, that's everybody, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Okay, so we see six things here. We see a great earthquake. Guess what? In the Middle East, they are on a huge, major fault line. Not surprising. The sun becomes blackened. Okay? That could be from the earthquake that that could actually happen, where the sun appears blackened. Moon became like blood. We're familiar with the red blood moons that happen from a lunar eclipse, but it can also happen as a result of an earthquake or a volcano. Stars fall from the sky. That could be asteroids and meteors, or it could be stars. The sky is split apart like a scroll. That's a simile. We don't really know how that could happen. Maybe it's a nuclear explosion. We don't know. Every mountain and island are moved out of its place. Can that happen? It can happen. 2010, there was an earthquake in Chile that moved the entire Earth three inches off its axis. So a tremendous earthquake could even trigger other earthquakes, and it could actually move every mountain out of its place. And we know that there are several fault lines all over the world that are due for a catastrophic event when that's going to happen. Okay? So right after... Many are martyred for their testimony. There are devastating earthquake. There are all these things that happen. 
Interesting. But the key thing that we want to notice is what's going on in verse 16 and 17. And we're going to talk about that in our groups, okay? We want to really dig into those two verses. We need to understand what they say. And then we, under, we want to understand what's the application for us for tonight. So we have six tables. A couple groups are pulling together because we have some people sick. Going back and really dig into verses 16 and 17 and see what you like. All right?